Hi, everyone. Welcome to Defining Whiteness. Joseph Pano, Henry Osawa Tanner, and the immutable imprint of the printers, Mark, with Dr. Laurie and Johnson, Associate Professor of Art History at Morgan State University. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. So this event is co-hosted by AAGA Baltimore, Society of Design Arts, also known as SODA, and Stevenson University. We are all Baltimore-based, but we know we have attendees from different cities joining us this evening, and we would love to know where you are. So feel free to use the chat box to let us know where, where you are this evening. Awesome, Eldersburg, Baltimore. Hi, Katie from Lincoln, Nebraska. Elena Volkova from Baltimore. Hi, Elena. Hi, from Rio, Fernanda Cardoso. <laughs> New York City, Curitiba, Brazil. We have some Brazilians. Denton, Maryland, Baltimore. Wow, this is exciting. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. Um, so, my name is Raquel Castedo, and I'm part of the AAGA Baltimore board as the Society of Design Arts liaison. This evening, I will be wearing my AAGA's hat to share a little bit about our organization. AAGA is the largest professional association of designers in the world, and it is committed to advancing the value and impact of design both locally and globally, and working together to inspire, support, and learn from each other at every stage of our careers. Our initiatives include Design for Democracy, Diversity and Inclusion, Design for Good, Women Lead, and In-House Initiative, and Emerge 2.0. We invite you all to learn more about AGA at aga.org. Our 75 chapters are run 100% by volunteers, serving over 20,000 members across the nation. We are always looking for volunteers, speakers, and sponsors, so reach out if you want to get involved. Um, I want to give a special shout out to all uh, of our AAJ chapter leaders, members, representatives from national, and especially the members of our local board of directors. For more information about our chapter, please visit baltimore.aaj.org. If you're not local and are interested in getting involved in our local chapter, go to aaj.org and then click on membership to find a chapter near you and learn about the benefits of becoming a member. This evening we have with us Richard Stanley, a member of the Society of Design Arts, who will be moderating the event and will tell you a little bit more about uh, SODA. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, Raquel. Good evening and uh, welcome to our fifth Soda Baltimore online program. In the background is our current exhibition at Stevenson University, which has limited visibility now, but I think uh, with an appointment, you can come in to take a look at it. We want to thank uh, Stevenson University along with AIGA for sponsoring our programs. Uh, the Society of Design Arts was founded over 15 years ago by a group of teachers, students and designers who formed a small all-volunteer group to pursue our interest in design history. One definition of design is a plan to make something, and we have expanded on that definition, whether that's a plan to make a better poster, a better building, or a better society. In more than 100 monthly presentations, we have invited speakers on many diverse topics, print, typography, architecture, many others. For a more complete picture, visit the poster gallery on sodabaltimore.com. And while you're there, sign up to be on our mailing list and check out the event calendar for upcoming events for both SODA and other related organizations. This spring, we have a number of exciting programs coming up. On March 2nd, Notes on Being a Dominican York with Ramon Tejeda. On March 30th, Angelina Lippert on the Swiss Grid. And April 28th, Greg D'Onofrio introduces his new book, Italian Types, Italian Designers in America. But tonight we are pleased to have Dr. Lori Johnson as our presenter. Dr. Johnson's PhD Associate Professor of Art History at Morgan State University here in Baltimore, Maryland. She specialized in modern and contemporary art, particularly in the 19th century. 
Her research focuses on the relationship between discourse and cultural practice with an emphasis on how art normalizes the operations of power through the representation of class, race, gender, and sexuality. Her current research projects include a study of early African-American photographers and how their images of Blacks both before, during, and after the Civil War reveal a history and legacy of the Black experience beyond that of victimization. In addition, she has published essays on the post-impressionist artist Pierre Bonnard and is currently completing publications on the sculptor Meta Warwick Fuller, French landscape painter Camille Corot, the pictorialist photographer F. Hollanday, and the architect Julian Abel. We're very pleased to have her speaking tonight. And so without further ado, Laurie, the stage is yours. Okay, great. I will um, share with you a screen right now. And I want to start off by thanking um, Richard um, and Raquel um, for helping with me tonight, but also Richard in particular for inviting me to present my um, research. Richard and I met um, about five years ago when I presented um, a talk at another um, AIGA sponsored event. Um, the topic, my topic that I'm going to discuss tonight is somewhat of a challenging one, especially, of course, in the current cultural climate in which we live, even though I'm placing it in historical context. Um, so I want to caution anyone if they hear terms that they're not comfortable with, they're not meant to make you feel uncomfortable. I also want to um, um, remind people to avoid using a, present, a presentist approach to the past. As I often tell my students at Morgan, the past can't know its future. So we're looking at the processes of historical formations, not just assuming that they already exist. And thus we want to avoid transforming in the word of the French um, semiologist um, Roland Barthes, transforming history into nature. Um, and that often too often happens, of course, with the Black experience in particular, which is always um, overdetermined as, in, as impoverished. And in this respect, I um, borrow um, somewhat from, say, Gayatri Spivak in her, of course, famous essay, Can the Subalterns Speak? And the way in which she um, talks about how subalterns and you know, the dispossessed, um, which is a term she takes from Antonio Gramsci, are predisposed in many ways to reclaim a cultural identity created for them by well-meaning Western intellectuals and academics, but it actually helps to reinscribe them in a, in a subordinate position in their society. So um, the talk I'm giving tonight addresses how, of course, that subordinate position is reinforced and how many of those stereotypes came into place. But I also want to remind people that none of this really exists, okay, that these are images and that we have often, but we often run with them as if they are reality. And so I begin here with a quote from, you know, the famous um, writer Oscar Wilde, um, which, of course, you know, you can read it there for yourself. And he couches it in the language of aestheticism, or say, you know, art for art's sake, to describe a human beings' basic need to structure our world in terms, you know, in familiar terms, okay? And that, like, as he so, you know, clearly says here, nature imitates art, um, not the other way around. The images are powerful, I think he means here, and how they kind of, you know, kind of a reinf reinforce um, things from our imagination that may or may not exist at all. And I'm discussing this, of course, in the context of the um, African-American artist Henry Osawa Tanner. I'm showing you here an image of him taken by a German artist from roughly um, from around 1907. At this point, he's been living in Europe for some time. Um, I show you the work, of course, because this is around, this is a famous image of him. Usually this, usually this is an image that will come up for him if you do a good Google search. At the time, of course, shortly about two years before, two years after this um, image was taken, he published his autobiography, Story of an Artist's Life, in um, the journal in the June issue of World's Work. Um, to commemorate, he was asked to basically write, of course, um, two, um, a two part essay that appeared first in the June edition of World's Work and another one in the July edition of World's Work to commemorate his 50th birthday. Um, Tanner was born in June of um, 1859. 
in the first, and so he's a very celebrated artist at this time. Um, he, you know, he's been in, like I said, um, in a number of salons. He has a world-renowned reputation. But in the first installment of this, of his autobiography, um, he recounts an incident that severely affected him. And what's startling about it is um, the way he writes about it. He's a 50 year old man, he has a wife, he has a son, he's won awards, he's had the career that he always wanted and never um, you know, imagined that he could, but you know, persevered and did have that career. And yet he's still haunted by an incident that took place when he was a student at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, in which he was symbolically lynched by his classmates. And he talks about how that event was so painful for him that he would, you know, um, oh, I'll read it to you in his own words, that he just, you know, every time he thought about it, it basically re, re brought up that, re, uh, reminded him or brought up those same notions again. He goes, quote, I was extremely timid and to be made to feel that I was not wanted, although in a place I had every right to be, even months afterwards caused me some weeks of pain. Every time one of these disagreeable incidents came to my mind, my heart sank and I was anew tortured by the thought of what I had endured almost as much as the actual event itself." Um, end quote. So like I said, he's talking about, like I said, an event that's, you know, Dewey Mosby talks about in his biography of him. Other people talk about it as well. And he's talking about, you know, when he first got to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in December of 1879. Um, by that time, Aikens, Thomas Aikens, who was one of his professors there, was teaching there, and he was doing very well. And then, of course, he encountered a group of students that included the illustrator Joseph Pinnell. And I show you in here an image from his 1825 Adventures of an Illustrator. Now, no one denies, of course, that Pinnell was an extremely gifted illustrator. Unlike Tanner, who got into um, PAFA on his very first try, Pinnell um, only got in on his second try and only because Charles Barnes, who was his professor at the um, Philadelphia um, Museum and School of the Industrial Arts, wrote a letter for him. After he got kicked out, he was expelled from the museum um, school because of his behavior. So he had a reputation as a student for being not just kind of cantankerous, okay, um, but, you know, the way that he was kind of, you know, kind of a real troublemaker. So he gets, he got kicked out of that school. He enrolls, of course, in the, uh, in PAFA. And then, of course, he describes um, several years later, decades later, just like Tanner, his experience of meeting Tanner in, an, in a chapter in the book, you know, that he titles The Coming of the Nigger. And he describes Tanner as such, he goes, quote, he came, he was young an octoroon, very well dressed, far better than most of us. He worked at night in the antique and last of all, he drew very well. I don't think that he stopped very long in the antique and he was run right out, run, run right through to life. He was quiet and modest and he painted too, it seemed among his other accomplishments. We were interested at first, but soon he passed almost unnoticed though the room was hot, end quote. So here, um, he just kind of describes his very first impressions of Tanner. Mind you, of course, um, Pinnell is a Quaker um, and he grew up in Germantown, Philadelphia. So both men, of course, you know, Philadelphians, um, you know, I would say born and bred, but, you know, uh, Tanner was actually born in um, Pittsburgh first before his family moved um, to Philadelphia when he was still young. But Pinnell, of course, I guess it was a native Philadelphian. And so it's interesting that he chooses to describe um, Tanner in these terms because he's from Germantown. And Germantown had a lot of Quakers, but it also had a lot of Dutch Germans and it had a lot of African Americans. Um, the unique thing or interesting thing about Philadelphia that it had always a large free black population, second only to Baltimore's free black population. Both cities enjoyed um, large free black populations. And as a result, you know, um, had a solid black uh, black middle class, which of course, you know, he, you can note in um, Pinnell's father was a dock worker. So he talks about how he was very well dressed. 
and far better dressed than the rest of them emphasizes that registers his envy that you know Tanner was talented and he went right from say you know the foundations class which you know he calls the antique you know studying of course you know from plaster class right through the life drawing because you know he was that good so he while well, he still had to kind of struggle along in, in um um you know in studying drawing plaster classes plaster plaster casts excuse me and then of course says that he was surprised that he didn't smell you know, even though the room was hot, okay. Then he goes on to describe the incident that Tanner also, of course, um, you know, just um, describes, and when it was Tanner registers that it was in his anguish, he kind of couches it as a kind of an incident of useful hijinks. And he goes, quote, he began, once again, he never really mentions Tanner by name, but he sets it up that he was, you know, the first black to come there. And we know that was Tanner, he goes, quote, then he began to assert himself and to cut a long story short, one night his easel was carried out into the middle of Broad Street and though not painfully crucified, he was firmly tied to it and left there. And this is my only experience with my colored brothers in a white school, but it was enough. Curiously, there has never been a great Negro or Jewish artist in the history of the world, end quote. <laughs> now it's funny, that, that he would, of course, make that last sentence there, considering that when he published this work, he's back in the United States. He had lived, of course, in Europe for a few decades in London. And then, of course, he's back, you know, states that I've been here about 10 years at this point. And he's writing this book in New York, right in the middle of the Harlem Renaissance. OK, so he knows full well that, that there are plenty of great Negro and Jewish artists. OK. Then at the same time, though, when he says he wasn't painfully crucified, no, he didn't, you know, he didn't hammer, of course, you know, nails into his, you know, hands and feet. But obviously that caused, you know, Tanner a great deal of pain. Okay. And that's something that he had to live with. But what's interesting thing to me here is when he describes that he was firmly tied, that the way in which they bind him to his easel, of course, you know, makes Tanner seem passive and helpless, okay, ties him to his, e e uh, to his easel, okay, qualities that we normally associate with Victorian femininity, like masculinity, and in that case, that does raise the issue of, of course, you know, artists at the end of the 19th century, particularly of course at PAFA, both men were trained by Aikens. And this kind of following a line of argument or thought from Martin Berger's great book, Man Made on Aikens, how men at that time, let me just go back here for a second, how artists at that time, you know, were often of course felt their masculinity was in question by the nature of their trade, of their profession. How Aikens himself, I guess he taught both men struggled, of course, with his masculinity and, you know, particularly, of course, in light of the fact that he was, you know, not meeting those, um, you know, benchmarks of man of Victorian manhood, such as having a, you know, regular, <laughs> getting a job, having, making a living, marrying, he did marry, but then he never had children, etc. And he had to stay at home longer than, um, you know, say he, you know, than a grown men did at that time. And that caused him also a little bit of unease and frustration, which he registers in much of his work. And of course, as um, Berger points out, excuse me, okay. One way in which, of course, to compensate for this was of course, through the image, of course, say of the, you know, dandy. Now, Pinnell, of course, and um, Aikens go to great lengths to avoid the marker or the label of dandy. And while normally when we think, of course, of Black images, derogatory images of Blacks in the 19th century, we too often think, of course, of Jim Crow. But another foil that you know was used in, say, illustrated magazines, such as, of course, the London Illustrated News, of course, was the image of, of course, the dandy. And we'll get to the dandy, of course, is only associated with sexual deviancy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So I'm showing you here, of course, a dandy slave with raincoat and cylinder, meaning, of course, his hat holding, you know, an unfurled umbrella um, over his mistress's head. This is, of course, a scene from Baltimore. Similar to the kind of broad sheets that you would find coming out of um, New York, which songs, you know, for covers, for covers for sheet music that also emphasize the dandified nature, say, of the Black male. Um, and this one in particular kind of gets at the heart of it, because you see, of course, here he's got the cylinder on, he's got, you know, the, um, the hat, he's got a walking stick. 
and of course, and he's got this cinched waist, okay, with his buttocks sticking out slightly, which is consistent, of course, with hypersexualized images of Black women also at this time. Okay, so in, you know, although, of course, we think about Jim Crow, and I'm showing you here T.D. Rice, who's credited, of course, say with the invention of, of Jim Crow, at least as he says, I was the original Jim Crow. You know, he's got something he was very proud of. Um, and Jim Crow is also someone who's asexual and emasculated, okay? But I would say that these figures aren't so much asexualized, it's just their sexualization is feminized. And of course, in the case of Jim Crow, he's entirely asexual. Now, images like that, of course, I guess they talk about the hypersexualization of Black women. And as Sandra Gilman points out, Black women are always linked to the prostitute, okay? And I show you, of course, here the famous image here of Mane's Olympia. Um, I'm also showing you here, of course, saying Amani, of course, always tried to be Charles Baudelaire's um, painter of modern life, even though, of course, that was Constantine Guy, the illustrator. Okay, and of course, I'm showing you here an image of, say, Jean Duval, of course, who was Baudelaire's lover on and off for 20 years, his Black Venus. Okay, and so this just shows an image of her. She was an Afro Caribbean. Um, sometimes actress, sometimes prostitute. In 19th century France, she would have been called a lorette, which of course is um, you know, a woman who is usually kept by, not an Olympia, you know, not an Olympia who's a high priced courtesan, but usually of course say um, someone kept by say someone like Baudelaire who was courted himself by his mother, of course, throughout much of his adult life in Canada. So here, of course, you know, the black woman is hypersexualized. And of course, also through her, her buttocks, I show you here the famous image of Sarchi Bartman, known in the West, of course, as the so-called hot and top Venus. And this is an image, of course, from Charles Cuvier, who was, of course, a um, French bi um, biologist. His ex, you know, his extracts on the observation made on a cadaver of a woman known in Paris and London under the name of the hot and top Venus. Now she was coy, she was originally from the, you know, that particular tribe in South Africa. And they like to cinch the waist of their young girls so that their buttocks would grow large as a sign of um, fertility and the fact that she would you know, grow and bear children and health. Um, but of course, but her buttocks was fetishized when she got to the West and associated with a hypersexualized uh, nature of so-called so hypersexualized nature of Black women. And like I said, and also that sticking out of the hip is consistent with what we see, say, in the music broadsheets here, which of course is associated, say, with femininity, femininity and particularly Black femininity through the so-called Hottentot. I show you here that this was also linked up, say, with the image of the dandy. And the dandy, of course, you know, is a man who would not live out his reproductive destiny by settling down and having children. You know, these, like I said, these benchmarks of Victorian manhood, which, like I said, were not something that not only concerned men in the United States, but also in Europe. And so here, this is work by Gustav Kayabar man on the balcony. Now, Kaibot was gay. And as Norma Brody points out in her great, a great essay, um, Outing Impressionism, um, Kaibot was only a great impressionist. He was also a great collector for the impressionists. You know, he came from, you know, he was the, he died young, um, but, you know, he was the son and heir of a railway magnet, et cetera. So he not only painted, he also collected a lot, um, a lot of um, impressionist art. Um, and of course, as Brody points out, once again, there's that hip. That hip, of course, was a mark of femininity, but also, you know, a mark of sexual deviancy, especially for a grown man. And so um, now, and of course, works like this, like Kayabat, serve as an occasion for homosexual panic in the press. And so, you know, uh, Drane, of course, who was, you know, a great characterist from the 19th century, um, you know, puts, you know, of course, better known as, of course, Jules Renard. In this particular, say, um, cartoon, he straightens him up, makes him, high, high, you know, hyperphalic. You know, he no longer get, gets rid of that hip. And of course, says, you know, this painting was causing people to sweat at the salon. So it was rolled out, you know, onto the balcony, you know, like, you know, like a little, and of course, kind of like a little hothouse plant. He shows the plant there. It was making people uncomfortable. You know, because of course of this representation of the male. And like I said, you can see the consistency here with the tight waist 
and the, you know, um, expanding hip, okay, along with the, the hyper, you know, well-dressed dandy, okay, the, his fixation on his fashion, et cetera, completely inconsistent, of course, with, you know, normalized understanding, say, of, you know, Victorian manhood on either side, say, of the Atlantic. And I show you here also an image created by the American Impressionist William Merritt Chase, who made a portrait of you know, his mentor and idol, um, James Abbott McNeil Whistler. But this work is the work that actually kind of caused you know, a demise in their relationship. Because, you know, now the truth be told, James Abbott, you know, Whistler, you know, was the quintessential dandy and kind of marketed himself that way. But he felt that, you know, Chase had gone too far in this portrait of him. He hated the portrait. When Chase brought it to him, he was disgusted. And that's what Chase writes about in his journal, that he felt the relationship was strained after that. Because once again, there's that waistline, you know, there's that waistline in which, you know, they kind of demonstrates kind of a very feminized form, got the hand on the hip and the walking stick and monocle, which we associate with the dandy. We remember dandyism wherever it was practiced, of course, you know, was associated with, like I said, a man who was not living out his reproductive destiny. You have to understand in Europe at this time, they were always obsessed, of course, with degeneration, that their, you know, their race, whether it's the French race or the Belgian race or whatever, is going to fall behind if they don't procreate. Natal natalism, of course, was as bad, say, as nativism in most of these countries. So, that's the hyper image, like the hypersexualized image, say of the black man, feeding off the hypersexualized image, say of the black woman, and then of course that also was consistent, say, with representation of Jews. And I show you here, of course, two images, of course, of Degas by Degas, who most people understand, of course, was a rabid, of course, anti-Semite, according to Lyndon Linda Nachman, in part because of his reaction, of course, say, um, during the Dreyfus affair, when, of course, a French, um, a Jewish French captain in the French army was accused, accused of um, sharing secrets with the Germans of espionage, um, exiled for 15 years, it took him that long to clear his name. And so, of course, you had, of course, a group of people who were Dreyfusards, like Camille Pizarro, who was Jewish himself, and then, of course, anti Dreyfusards, like Degas. So, in here, which is interesting because one of Degas' closest friends was Ludovico Alevi. Um, and of course, you know, I mean, he knew his children. Um, Ludovico's oldest son, Daniel, wrote a very moving biography that he published in 1917. The same year that the God died. And he talks about how, you know, the one scene was in a discussion over the over the Dreyfus affair, he said the God left the house and he did not come back. He did not return until his father had already passed away and he came to pay his respects at his funeral. And, rem and I remind you, you know, Alevi, of course, who was a librettist, and he actually was the librettist for um, Jock Offenbach's Orpheus in Hell. Um, Alavia, of course, you know, and Degas had grown up together, you know, they were very close, extremely close, but he sacrificed the friendship, you know, because, you know, Alavia didn't disagree with him over the Dreyfus affair. So here, now, he doesn't quite cinch Ludovico's waist, but once again, he has the unfurled umbrella or walking stick, once again, as a kind of dandified nature. He does a similar thing, of course, in portraits at the stock exchange, and of course, you know, the exaggerated nose, and of course, the hints at secrecy. Um, France had just suffered about four years earlier, of course, a crash in which the, the Degas family had lost a good deal of money. Um, and so looking for a scapegoat, you know, they blamed, of course, you know, the Jews. In this case here, this gentleman here is his actually one of his collectors, Ernest May. But he shows him there, of course, with his walking stick. They're outside the Boers, and it looks like they're collaborating, you know, that, that old stereotype, which the Nazis themselves would pick up on later, okay, and say that, you know, that Jews, along with communists, was collaborating, of course, against, you know, the rest of us. So, you know, Degas participated in that discourse. Unfortunately. And this is some of the Pennell's um, image, say, of the Jew, which is interesting because, you know, he takes a trip, and this image here is not from Paris, not from New York, not from Baltimore, not from one of the centers of modernity in the West, but from, of course, the small town in British, um, Russia. You know, he's um, 
you know, Pinnell as an illustrator was often, of course, um, commissioned, of course, or sent to these places by magazines. In this case, once again, the London, Illustrated London News. And so that's what he was asked to do. He comes back, um, he goes there in 1891, and he makes a series, of course, of sketches that are published in the Illustrated L London News. And then he will publish them, of course, in his own book, writing a text with the assistance of his wife, um, um, Elizabeth Robbins Pinnell, also from Philadelphia. Yeah, the Jew at home impressions of a summer and audience, autumn spent with him. And basically it's just a catalog of images of different types of say, you know, Orthodox Jews and the most vicious stereotypes and sayings. And so here um, you can't hardly see it because of course it's a share option, but nevertheless, he said he takes a stroll and he's very proud of his costume. Okay, and so here, <laughs> mind you, you know, this is totally made up because this is czarist Russia. You know, there there is no fashion industry. There is no, you know, understanding of taking a stroke. But he couches him in these terms, once again, with the walking stick, dandifies him in a culture that has, the dandy is a quintessential modern subject. There is no modernity, and it was a little bit of modernity, but not that much modernity, of course, in Russia, in czarist Russia at this time. You know, they, they have to catch up to the rest of the world. But nevertheless, he pulls out that stereotype and cast him in that role. And there's a similar thing, like I said, in his images also say of Blacks, particularly of course this type of burlesque of course that you, or lampooning that you find in say the Blackface menstrual shows, which by the 1890s weren't as popular say as just say, you know, Blacks as minstrels singing, just singing, you know, themselves, okay. And so here, like I said, once again, um, you know, he participates in this kind of lampooning, say, of Blacks in order, like I said, I argue, to um, demonstrate, say, to once again try to validate his own manhood. He and Akins are nervous, of course, about their own masculinity as artists, which is not a profession that one associates with a great deal of masculinity. And as Martin Berger points out in his book, um, Man Made, you know, he lowest the way in which of course the minstrel show was read by the end of the 19th century um by say the 1870s 1880s and say the post bellum america now mind you like i said you already have a lot of black minstrels at this time and so while he's not showing blackface minstrelsy this is a watercolor beautiful watercolor in fact that's at the uh, metropolitan museum of art he does try to he does kind of play off of some of those tropes of say blackface minstrelsy when she's showing, of course, a group of minstrels rehearsing at home. Now there's, of course, his hat and cane right here as a dancing man. And of course he's playing a banjo. Now the banjo, of course, had been used uh, particularly by T.D. Rice, but also Dan Emmett, other say um, performers who specialized in blackface minstrelsy in the 1840s before the Civil War as a mark, say, of the, you know, of the black, okay, since, of course, the banjo is, of course, originally an African instrument. By the end of the 19th century, though, it had lost that meaning. So you have to ask yourself, why are Aikens and others trying to reinscribe that meaning, knowing full well that it had not, was no longer really associated with those types of derogatory images of blacks? And I would put out that that because as an artist, like I said, who often, of course, was you know pressured or felt pressured by society to represent a certain image of white maleness, the black blacks, of course, you know, um, were convenient. It shows the malleability, of course, of race, of course, and sexuality and class. Like I said, in this era in which, of course, you know, men were very much constrained. Okay by prescribed norms for manhood, and particularly white middle class manhood, you know, this Akins was decidedly middle class, and you know, um, he enjoyed that status, but he was also con constricted by it in many ways. And so this was a kind of way for him to kind of break out of that status on the back, say, of, of blacks, of course, and in some cases, poor whites. So I show you here on Tanner's response to that. Now remember, Tanner was his student, just like Pinnell. Tanner is living in Europe at this time in 1893. He gives a paper though, he comes back home briefly. He had, he had a bout with typhus and he just wanted to come home for a moment. He was always, in spite of the fact that he expatriated to Europe, he always remained very close to his parents, um, particularly his father, who was himself um, a publisher of a black newspaper, the uh, Christian Recorder the founder of it. So at the um, World Expo that year, he gives a paper about, say, 
how he felt people who should be representing people, uh, Black culture, people who understood it best. And, you know, that some people take that as a swipe, but he's thinking about that work from 15 years earlier by his, you know, by his mentor Akins, in which he felt that that was a derogatory image of Blacks. So almost like in his response to it, he demonstrates here in the banjo lesson, they're not singing and dancing. It's just kind of an intimate scene between a grandfather and his grandchild in which she's, the grandfather's listening intently. And this is typical of symbolist type of work, even though, uh, even though, of course, uh, Akins was a realist, I would argue that Tanner definitely had symbolist impulses, and this is one of them. It's an interior scene, um, like, of course, um, James Enzor's listening to Sh listening to Schubert. In this case, here, the old man listens intently to the music that, as he's trying to teach his grandson, the little boy's trying to fret, you know, the neck on the neck of the banjo, which is too big for him, which is why his grandfather kind of has to hold the upper part of the neck for him as he's playing on the sound box. So it's a question about handing down a tradition, a tradition that goes all the way back, say, to Africa, and um, which is different, say, from the way in which, say, Akins represents it and the way in which the banjo at that time had become kind of a fashionable instrument. And I show you here, Mary Cassatt's banjo lesson also from 1893 you know mind you Cassatt is also from Pittsburgh studied at you know in Philadelphia just like Tanner and they made the same trajectory left and settled in Europe um, for different reasons but nevertheless she went to be a great artist just like Tanner she went you know went to stay in Europe and at the center of modernity now, by the way, at the end of the 19th century, the banjo was not had lost, say, its you know association, say, with um, blackface minstrelsy, and it became, of course, in many respects, a very fashionable instrument for young women in, at the end of the Victorian era, and that's what you see here. Another type of lesson, you know, our music uh, banjo lesson, but one has completely lost any of those so the previous associations. And that's in part because you had these two brothers, these are Canadian brothers, they were Canadian um, Blacks um, who, so as members of the Commonwealth, they had an act that they would do in London, and they even performed for um, Edward the um, Seventh after, um, of course, his mother, Queen Victoria, had died. And so the shows, first James was over, and James is the brother on the left. And James, of course, you know, writes to George and say, hey, come on over. I mean, it's great, man. You know, I mean, people love it. You know, they love this stuff, you know. And so, you know, you can see they're wearing, of course, their um, um, tie, white, tie, white ties and tail, white beard and tie and tails um, as they're playing, of course, the banjo. And it made it very, something fashionable for Elise to show this picture here of this young, you know, beautifully dressed young white woman, you know, playing the banjo, you know. Um, so it began, it, it began to have those connotations by the end of the century. Okay. And then, like I said, so that goes back to, say, Akins' own insecurity about his sexuality, which I would argue was similar, say, to Pinnell's. Now, Aikens tried to compensate for, like I said, through images like the um, dancing lesson, where he, whether he was aware of it or not, but also through images like, say, his famous The Gross Clinic. Now, this is a life-size work that was, of course, at the um, Thomas Jefferson Medical School in Philadelphia. Then they sold it, and it ended up uh, path and the bought in the uh, excuse me Philadelphia Museum of Art bought perfect work. And then now, of course, now it hangs in um, the um, Philadelphia Museum of Art. But in this work, he's trying to once again show the masculinity, the masculine nature of painting <clears throat> by associating with medicine. Medicine, a, a profession that had recently had recently professionalized itself, you know, by entering into medical schools, by having particular standards, by having associations and societies to set the standards for what it, you know what good medical practice was. And Sam McGross was a key figure in that. You know, um, the Anatomy Atlas, Gross Anatomy, which most medical students you know use to this day. You know, was originally, of course, you know, say based off of this era with Samuel Gross. And so Gross is here, and <laughs> a lot of people found the image of Gross because it was so realistic. He's showing, of course, surgery in which he's repairing a young man's femur. And so that's the patient right here, here's his leg, okay? 
Um, here's Aikens back here, just kind of casually looking as if he's a medical student, as if being an artist is like being a doctor, requires training, has certain professional standards. He's trying to once again demonstrate that art is also a profession, you know, something very professional, um, an, an example of man, professional manhood, which is what he's trying to claim. And then also, but that, that counter, you know, say, or fits in with. Um, images like this, you know, this is his Salutar from 1898, in which he's showing Billy Smith, who was at the time, you know, the featherweight champion um, of the world, um, and he asked him, of course, to come and pose for him a couple of times, and so you can see the latent homoeroticism in the world. Like I said, Aikens' sexuality is always, say, um, you know, Malleable, and for him, you know, what he registers in his work is the overall malleability of, you know, sexuality and particularly masculine sexuality during at the end of the Victorian era. And like I said, his own insecurities about his sexuality and his masculinity, because of course, you know, of the nature of his profession. And this is as a painter. So if this was true for Aikens, this was doubly true for, say, designers and illustrators like um, Pinnell, who were also <clears throat> trying to, you know, professionalize their profession, make it say something that wasn't basically a trade or artisanal and move it, uh, kind of elevate it up to say, to the level of professional, but that involved training. And you know, one way that designers did this is that they divorced, say, the production from the overall design, that they would maybe do the design, but someone else would actually do the producing. In Pinnell's case, he, you know, throughout his career did both. Um, and he held to those older traditions in which, you know, he was both, say, the designer or the illustrator, as well as the publisher of his own books and illustrations. And so, but also it shows you the class of men, okay, these kind of toughs who, of course, you know, entered into those professions. Now, from a class issue, and like I said, you know, Pinnell always questioned, you know, um, the lack of prestige for, say, designers and illustrators. They didn't have the same prestige as doctors and lawyers who had also recently professionalized. And one reason is that their craft wasn't seen as essential. I mean, you always need a good lawyer, you always need a good doctor, but you always need a good designer. And so it took them longer to be able to elevate the, their, the standards for their professions. And one way in which they did that was through clubs, you know, um, drawing clubs, sketching clubs, um, and associations in which they specifically barred Blacks, Chinese, um, and sometimes even Jews. Even the Jews, of course, had their own association. They didn't go ahead and just establish it. I'll establish my own association, okay? As did, of course, a number, say, of Blacks, okay? Um, they particularly felt threatened by the Chinese out West because the Chinese would hire whites. And then they would say in their clubs, you can't hire any Chinese and you can't hire anybody who worked for the Chinese as well. So they would, be, they would exclude them along those racial lines. And specifically, of course, and Pinnell also, of course, was the head of the sketch club when he got back to the United States in New York. And also, of course, you know, they specifically excluded, of course, non-whites. And so here, it kind of gives you a sense of the kind the, the class of men who entered into these um, these spaces. And of course, many of them, of course, you know, kind of like look like you know Bowery toughs. Okay, they're having kind of a little boxing match. In the case, also say with Sayuta, often the club members of these boxing clubs, which you know were you know like gentlemen's clubs. Um, were um, upperclassmen, but the boxers themselves were always working class boys there for their entertainment. And of course, in the case of, say, Aikens, he's able to kind of establish both his masculinity and his upper class status, you know, that he's of a higher class than, say, Billy Smith, like I said, through, his, through this type of imagery. And then here I show you just, of course, stereotype, an example of stereotype casting. Once again, a very working class trade, okay, trying to elevate itself. And a quick and easy way to elevate itself, of course, is through the, you know, the denigrating, say, of the other, whether it's Jews, whether it's Blacks, whether it's, of course, you know, Chinese. At the time, you know, that's, of course, how they were able, of course, to establish these professions as, claim these professions as their own, push out groups that they did not like, 
and also, like I said, elevate both their social status, but also their sense of masculinity as well. Um, and that's definitely the case um, in the case of both, I would say, Pinnell and um, Aikens. Okay, so I'll take questions. <laughs> Get back to uh, live here. <laughs> Thank you. That was <laughs> excellent. Um, it's uh, there's so many different uh, threads that went off from that, mm -hmm. that, and that really would be great to explore uh, the idea of the symbolist uh, things. It was really intriguing to see how uh, costume and and gesture and so forth can connote a particular cultural stereotype, which is used to then you know expand on that idea um I, one thing i remember from an earlier conversation as you said that tonight's presentation was going to be the first part of several investigations that you were working on in different subject areas that perhaps at one point would come together into a, a final product and i wonder if you can tell me a little bit more about that project and how it's going along um, well, this is the first chapter in a book I've been working on for about five years. And it deals, of course, first of all, with, you know, too often, of course, once again, kind of like once it's stereotyping and casting, like Blacks are cast as the Black church or Black art. It's if the, and it's particularly a case in the artists, is if they don't have an actual, say, style, okay? Um, like I said, I'm seeing one question, of course, um, but um, I didn't say Aikens was gay. I said that he had, you know, that, that he may possibly his, his his I don't know what his sexuality was, but his, you know, the imagery, of course, is say um, homoerotic for sure. Okay, but like I said, this is part say of this is chapter one in a much larger book project. But, you know, um, and it deals, of course, with Blacks as symbolists, not necessarily just as Black artists, which is normally the way that they're cows, as if they don't belong to a particular period and a particular style, and they don't share those concerns of, let's say, that period and that style. Now, in the case of Tanner, he kind of, because, of course, his, you know, Aikens was decidedly a realist, you know, it's not until he gets to Europe that he begins to, and he's at the Academie Julienne. So he has all of that kind of, you know, experience as he finally arrives in Europe. Well, symbolism is the movement at that time. Mm -hmm. So he can't avoid it. When he leaves Path, he goes down south. And initially, when he gets the idea for banjo lesson, he's in the Highlands of North Carolina. But it's not until almost a decade later that he revisits that theme when he's in Europe. Um, and retools themes that he'd been exploring also with bagpipers and um, sabot makers. You know, once again, someone passing a tradition from one person to another and it didn't really matter whether it was a question of race. I think that the work is overdetermined. It's racial, it seems more like it's generational. And the sabot makers, an old man, the um, the bagpiper less bagpipe less is also an old man and a young boy. So once again, it's in, a, in a, all three words come up around the same time as he's exploring those different themes. Um, but then there is that paper that he gave when he was in Chicago in 1893, in which he wanted to make clear, you know, maybe you shouldn't treat these types of subjects if you don't really understand these types of experiences, you know, which seems like a swipe at say Aikens. Yeah, that's uh, it, it, that's fascinating. Um, let's see. I have a question over here. Let's try this one out here. Uh, it says, "Hope your scholarship is disseminated throughout, that students can get a fuller and more insightful." I hope I'm reading all of this. Oh, I'm sorry. There's more to the question here than I can see. Let me look. Sorry, move this around. Okay, here we go. Hope your scholarship is disseminated throughout the art historian world so that students can get a fuller and more insightful reaccounting of the canon. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure there's a question in there, but perhaps you can. <laughs> <I didn't know. laughs> <laughs> <But> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think that is the question uh, about the canon. The canon has to be more inclusive, but it also has to be more inclusive in a way that um, it doesn't put Blacks in the alcove part. And I think often, like I said at the outset, um, too often um, Blacks alcove themselves by claiming 
things like the black church or black art. I don't see it as black art. I see it just simply as art and that by blacks practicing, it doesn't mean we, do, that we ignore the racial um, you know, content there, but you know, Tanner is a symbolist as are the other people in that book, in my book, they're symbolists, okay? And you know, and they have to be understood as such, their style is symbolist. And actually the fact that they're doing symbolism, I say symbolism appeal to them in many respects because they were black, because of symbolist tendency to separate, to show the distance, I should say, between rhetoric and reality. You know, that's, I think, why that particular movement appealed to them at the end of the 19th century. Would that be a, a characteristic of why the portraits of the banjo players were so dramatically different? I mean, Tanner's was a very soft, um, evocative uh, portrayal. Mm -hmm. It wasn't uh, sharp and realistic like Eakin's. Uh, mm -hmm. Does that speak to the symbolist aspect of it? Yeah, definitely. Um, the light sources, he uses two different light sources in the work. Um, he it's an interior scene. Now, Aikens is also an interior scene, but and Aikens is a much smaller work. Um, the banjo lesson by um, uh, by Tanner is a, is a, is a large scale work. Um, you, you can go see it at Hampton um, in Virginia, but it's a big painting. Mm -hmm. um, whereas like I said, whereas, you know, Aikens is just a small sketch. It's a, just a little watercolor. Now the interesting thing is though, is that um, when Tanner painted the banjo lesson, he showed it at Salon, he got no mention whatsoever. When Aikens shows that little watercolor though, he got, he got a silver medal at the Massachusetts Mechanics Society. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, another question. Uh, not sure if this is a question. I was not sure about Eakins and whether he was a homosexual or just trying to emphasize masculinity. That's the argument. That's what I said. I didn't say he was a homosexual. Yeah. I said that he was trying to establish his sexual, his masculinity as an artist. That okay. an artist's masculinity was always under question, under, you know, and he wanted to help establish it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see, another one here. Um, it was really interesting how many of the designers came from working class backgrounds. Can you speak more about that? I think that's one of the things, that's kind of the rub, isn't it? Don't most people come from working class backgrounds? I think in America, like people like to pretend they're middle class when they're actually working class. You know, in Europe, people don't make that mistake. They're very class conscious and very proud of the working class origins. So, you know, yeah, I wouldn't go around counting how many designers were working class, I just think the nature of a designer in the 19th century, it's a trade. These are tradesmen. By definition of their profession, they're working class. <laughs> That's true. I think in Europe, um, designers are, are trained um, as craftsmen. Uh, in the 19th very... century, I meant you were, if you were a designer, you were a craftsman. It's not until after the Civil War that they began to try to professionalize themselves and they professionalized late. Right. Yeah, like, but yeah. I think I think in America, because of the nature of race in this country, poverty and working classes is always overdetermined as not white, and that whites often define themselves as middle class when they're working class. Oh, okay, yeah, a little bit of difference in terminology there, the cultural. Yeah, terminology was well, culturally. I mean, you know, politicians will say middle class when they really should be saying working class, hard middle class Americans, which we usually translate as white Americans. And then when they say poverty, we just trans automatically translate that as black. Oh, okay. Another, um, do you feel there is a distinction between painters and illustrators in how, oh, they, yeah. in how they reflect culture? Um, I think that because an illustrator can be more, much more immediate with the sketch, you know, that automatically, but I don't think the, the discourse surrounding the imagery can be the same. It's just the effect that it has. I mean, Pinnell's images could circulate much wider because they were illustrations and he had he could make multiples of them. So I think the impact of them can be much more difficult. Um, I mean, much, you know, much more significant than say at Aikens, you would actually have to go physically see the works, okay? Um, and I think because of course, you know, um, obviously it takes longer, right? You know, uh, a painter, a painting, especially an oil work can, you know, take, can, can take longer. Was Tanner ever an illustrator? Did he ever do illustrations or they're all- He did some illustrations. Mm -hmm. he, did, he did do both. Um, he was even given, I think, the Légion d'honneur, of course, for his work during say World War II, World War One. Okay, yeah. Um, let's see, here we go. Um, do you recommend any resources for students to continue learning 
more about your studies and the history behind these artists so that we can remain informed? A good question. I would say, um, you know, let's see what resources. Well, I think that it depends on what you want. If you want to know more about Aikens and you want to know more about Tanners, or just, you know, just go to your you know, library and, and type into the catalog. If you want to have, I think, a different reading of these works that, like I said, like Spivak says, where you are moving beyond the white intellectuals re-inscribing you as inferior, even though he's trying to be nice about it. You know, like I said, that's, that's kind of how I started off. Too often, I think, um, Black artists, intellectuals, just across the board, and this is problem I find um, throughout, you know, um, Black academia and just academia in general, it's like Spivak said, you know, we're asked to reclaim a culture, but a culture that was created for us as inferior, as poor, as this, as that, and then we were claiming that and celebrating that. But she's like, that was something that was created by, not by us, but by our so-called liberators. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I think that would be the question is uh, to find out more about this contrast and how these things develop and what the ramifications were of it. Yeah, it's easy enough to research the people themselves. Um, okay, I don't see any others. Uh, so <laughs> maybe I'll turn it back to Raquel with my great thanks for coming mm -hmm. on and, and talking to us tonight. This was very informative as always. Mm -hmm. uh, talking to you, I hope you'll... Uh, come back as your project progresses, come back and, uh, and give us some more information. We appreciate it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I wanna thank you, Lori, so much for your talk. It was amazing to hear you making all these connections and walking um, us through all this um, amazing paintings. And it's a, a lot of new information for me. So I'm really, I'm really excited to explore more and read more about about it. So it's thank you so much for for doing this and sharing your your knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. I, I so I, I want you to do you want to say a few words like uh, final and and then I'm gonna thank you our participants. Oh, I would um, like I suggest as a final comment, I think that especially for the students in the room, don't take things at face value. I think we often assume we know Black culture and we know this and we know that. But like I said, often what we're defining as Black culture is a culture that was packaged and given to us and we just kind of ran with it. You know, and so I think the, the question is always to read more, but always to question more. And often, you know, people say they want to be more inclusive, but, you know, look at your own cultures, okay, and see how they might, they might be, might have been packaged and handed back to you in a way that kind of serves the status quo, reinforces the status quo. And so I think that that's the thing, ultimately, then if, this, if anyone can take away from that, the next time I look at that image, I'll question, the next time I hear the term, the Black church, I'll question, is there such a thing or are there different denominations that Black people belong to? I mean, I'm Catholic, so, you know, I mean, so is, is that part of the Black church? I don't know, I mean, you know, what, what exactly are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, wow. That's the question. Mm -hmm. that, that's an amazing takeaway, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, ask uh, questions about what we, the, the stories mm -hmm. we've been told, right? Yes, <laughs> the stories we've been told. Yeah. And if we want to get past moments like the ones we had last summer, we have to also re retell those stories so that, you know, you don't, you know, end up with a situation like on, on Capitol Hill last month or, you know, um, or last summer in Minneapolis. <laughs> yes. Um, mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a great, um, a great way, a way to to end the event. I want to thank you, everyone, for joining us mm -hmm. today uh, this mm -hmm. evening, and a huge thank you again to Dr. Laurie Johnson for sharing her knowledge with us. Um, mm -hmm. Feel free to reach out directly. Um, is there a, like, are you open to to get? You should uh, reach out to me. I need to, I, I will say this, I'm very bad at advertising myself, and so I need to clean up my academia.edu page, <laughs> Morgan page, but just reach out to me if you want to reach out to me at Morgan, that's fine. Awesome, yeah. so we um, encourage you to reach out to Lori with um, mm -hmm. any questions. So I want to talk briefly about our upcoming events, just to, as a reminders and um, 
In March, we have an event scheduled, as Richard said, for the second with the artist uh, Ramon Tejada and another one on the 30th with Angelina Lippert from Poster House. In April, we'll have Greg Donofrio giving a talk on his recent books, uh, one of his recent books. And we'll also have AJ Baltimore's Ink and Pixels. And starting in May, we will uh, have a series of events dedicated to history of Latin American design that we're very excited about. So if you'd like to be notified when we schedule our next event and to get more information, find out about community events and read blog posts uh, on our websites, baltimore.aj.org and sodabaltimore.com. Thank you again for spending time with us this evening and be sure to follow us on social media. Have a great rest of your evening. Mm -hmm. Bye. Good night. Bye. -bye.